Hey, what's up you guys, it's Michael here. So today we're gonna to talk about index funds, ETFs, and mutual funds, the similarities and differences between them, pros and cons of using each of these funds, and what you actually need to know about them. If you are confused at all about using these different investment funds and are trying to figure out which one might be the best for you, be sure to stick around to the end as this video will be really helpful and is really full of important details about these type of investment funds. So it's actually really common for investors to get mixed up between index funds, ETFs, and mutual funds. And even though they are all types of investment funds, they're actually very different to each other. So when I hear people use index funds and ETFs interchangeably, it really does make me cringe a bit. Index funds are not the same as ETFs, please don't make this mistake. And it's gonna be important that you guys pick the right one for yourself from the start, as it can be costly and annoying to change later on, which is actually what happened to me and I wanna save you guys this trouble, but it will never be too much trouble to smash the like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. No, but seriously guys, if you find this type of content useful, I would really appreciate it if you could just gently tap the like button down below, as it isn't too much effort, and it does actually help me out a lot. Now with that out of the way, let's get right into the video. So to start with, there's a lot of similarities and benefits that are common between mutual funds, ETFs, and index funds, which I'll outline before diving deep into each fund type. So all of these funds offer two major benefits. The first is convenience. By investing in a mutual fund, index fund, or ETF, you get to own a bunch of different companies all in one easy package. One of these funds could have thousands of different individual stocks inside it, but you only ever have to make one purchase to own a portion of all of them. And in a world without funds, if you wanted to have, say, a thousand different stocks in your portfolio, you'd actually have to make a thousand separate purchases. And if you're paying, for example, $10 per trade in brokerage, that would end up costing you $10,000 alone just buying the companies. It would also take you a lot of time in doing this as well. However, depending on the fund you chose, you would either pay nothing to enter the fund or just pay a one-time fee. This is way simpler than trying to self-manage a portfolio of thousands of different companies, constantly trying to rebalance weightings every day. Through owning a lot of different stocks, this actually gives you the other major benefit of these investment funds, and that is diversification. Like even if you have 10 individual stocks in your stock portfolio, if one of these goes down and fails, you can end up actually losing a lot of money. On the other hand, if you go and buy the entire S&P 500 index fund, then you have 500 different stocks and companies that all contribute to your overall return. So even if one of these fails, it doesn't really matter because you have 499 other companies to boost you up. This actually means that having a few individual companies go up or down in the market in the short term won't really affect your overall return because you're betting long-term that the market as a whole will rise. Also, doing this as an investor will give you a lot more market stability because let's be real, most people can't handle the market volatility and as soon as they see it go down, they panic and then they freak out and then they sell it and then they see it going back up again and then they buy back because it's going back up now. Then they've done the worst thing in investing which is to buy high and sell low. That's why investing in index funds, ETFs and mutual funds solves most of these issues for the regular investor. So now looking to these funds individually, I'll start off with mutual funds, which were actually the original investment fund out of these three types, and they've been around the longest. A mutual fund is a type of investment product where the funds of many investors are actually pulled into a single investment product. The fund then focuses on the use of those assets on investing in a group of assets to reach the fund's investment goals. Now it's important to note here, by pure definition, a mutual fund can actually be either an actively managed fund or a passive index fund. But industry-wide, it's widely assumed when someone is referring to a mutual fund these days, they are actually talking about an actively managed fund, so something that's being traded actively. And for simplicity's sake, I'll be using the same assumption when talking about mutual funds in this video. The simplest way to think about mutual funds is imagine you have this super smart friend who is great at picking stocks and you see they're always making lots of money all the time. Then you think to yourself, wow, I wish I could just give my money to my friend so he can invest on my behalf as well. But then imagine your friend isn't necessarily the nicest friend and then he tells you, sure, he'll do this, but he's gonna charge you a fee for his services. And then he also tells you that this fee will need to be paid regardless of whether he actually makes you any money or not. And he isn't gonna guarantee to make you money. And then imagine your friend is really not nice at all and then tells you that if he does actually perform really well 
and gets you a good return, well then he'll actually charge you an additional performance fee. Well, if you've got that pictured in your head, that's pretty much what a mutual fund is. So with that example, the main thing to know about mutual funds is that they are typically actively managed, which as I just explained, really just means that they have a person, usually someone called a fund manager, who will be actively trading the portfolio of investor funds to achieve the investment goal of the fund. And the investment goal is usually just to achieve a return that is greater than the overall market. But that's just it. It is just a goal and it rarely actually happens. In a report released by the S&P in 2019 on how actively managed funds performed against their benchmarks, it showed that active managers continue to show dismal performance against the overall market. For the ninth consecutive year, the majority of large cap mutual funds lag the S&P 500, and that's just over a one year period. When looking at the data over longer periods, this gets really, really dismal. Over a 15 year period, less than 9% of active mutual funds were able to outperform the S&P 500 index. However, in saying that, there is still a non-zero chance that you're actually able to find a mutual fund that is able to beat the market over the long run. However, in return for managing your money, these actively managed mutual funds will charge an annual fee of typically one to 2% of your account balance every single year. So at 2%, if you invested $10,000 in a mutual fund, $200 of that is going straight into the fund manager's pocket every single year, regardless of whether they beat the index or not. And even if the manager makes poor investment decisions, and your account balance actually goes down next year, you still get charged 2%. So you could literally end up with less money than you started with, but the fund manager would still get paid millions of dollars for their services. And over the years, these fees will really reduce your nest egg and portfolio by hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the vast majority of mutual funds are probably not worth the higher fees, given that the vast majority don't even beat the overall market. And the final point I wanted to make about mutual funds is how you actually invest in them. These aren't like shares, which are traded on the stock market. They will normally have a website set up where you can create an account and then you end up transferring cash directly into the investment fund. This is often quite a bit more clunkier than buying and selling through a stock exchange. So your money is going to be a little less liquid when using a mutual fund. And it's something to note if you are gonna be wanting fast access to your cash. And they will also usually have a minimum balance requirement in order to open an account in the first place, which does just make it a bit harder to get started. So moving on to index funds, which are actually a type of mutual fund that were born out of the desire for low fee, passive index tracking funds, and this is actually what created the index fund. And like the name suggests, index funds are always passively tracking an index. And if you don't know what an index is, it's actually a method to track the performance of some group of assets in a standardized way. Indexes typically measure the performance of a basket of securities, stocks intended to replicate a certain area of the market. These may be broad based to capture the entire market, such as the S&P 500, or the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, for example, or they can be much more specialized, such as indexes that track a specific industry or geography. And indexes are also created to measure other financial or economic data, such as interest rates, inflation, or manufacturing output. So index funds are actually similar in a lot of ways to mutual funds. In fact, they're a type of mutual fund, except that the fees will be much lower because there isn't a fund manager who needs to be employed to actively trade the fund. And as a consequence, the performance of the index fund will closely mirror the index it is tracking. What this means is that you won't actually get any potential outperformance of the index. And a unique component of the index funds is that because they are tracking an index, a thing called tracking error occurs. And this is basically the index return minus the index fund return, which equals the tracking error. And the management fee that you are paying when you choose to use an index fund is essentially paying them to make sure that they track this index as close as possible i.e. minimizing that tracking error. Therefore, if an index fund is actually good at tracking an index doing their job, then this tracking error should be equal to their management fee or as close as possible. And if it is a lot larger than their management fee, then you should probably consider if it's a good index fund to be using as they aren't doing what you are paying them to do. With index funds, because there is no team of stock pickers or a highly paid Wall Street expert that's choosing which stocks to include in the fund, the fees on average are much, much lower than against an active mutual fund. 
For example, one of the most popular index funds in the world, and actually the first ever index fund for individual investors, the Vanguard 500 index fund in the US, has a management fee of only 0.04% which is incredibly low when compared to active funds, which are usually at least 1%, which is over 25 times higher. Passive index funds really are great for most individuals, as most investors out there will make way more money investing in an index than they would investing in individual stocks on their own or using an active mutual fund. Several studies have actually shown that over 90% of portfolio managers these are professionals, couldn't even outperform the market index over any 15 year period. And keep in mind that these are people who are the brightest in their field, who've gone to Ivy League schools with a really deep understanding of economics and finance, who do this full time daily, and not even they can outperform just the market index. And those figures are so, so much worse for an individual investor. A big reason is that so many investors tend to trade emotionally and panic when the market drops, also known as panic selling. And then they do this thing called market timing where they jump back in when they think it's a good time, but it really never is. And they end up just getting much lower than average returns and definitely do not beat the overall market. Also in a 2017 interview, the legendary Warren Buffett went so far to say that index funds make the best retirement sense practically all the time. Really attempting to pick times to buy and sell stocks is a mistake for 99% of the population. He even went as far as to say and bet a collection of hedge fund managers a million dollars that they couldn't even beat the market over a 10 year period and outperform an index fund. And he won. A standard low cost Vanguard index fund beat some of the most highly paid and expensive fund managers in the world. So if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. So like we touched on earlier with mutual funds, the liquidity of index funds is something you need to be aware of as well and can actually be a double-edged sword. Yes, it may be slower to get the money in and out of the fund when compared to the stock market. However, if you are someone who does tend to panic and watch prices constantly, this lower liquidity could actually help you not make big mistakes like selling if the price dips a bit. Furthermore, there is a benefit here in that you can set up automatic transfers from your bank account directly into the index fund and you don't need to worry about placing orders. This makes index funds a very hands-free autopilot investing strategy, which is great for the vast majority of investors. So moving on to ETFs, which are the newest form of these three investment funds. ETF actually stands for exchange traded fund and this is exactly what it is. An ETF is a fund that instead of buying into the fund through bank transfers and transferring in and out of it directly, you can purchase portions of the fund directly on a stock exchange. If you wanna know more about ETFs in particular, check out my in-depth guide on getting started with ETFs, which I'll link above. Now, ETFs can be both passively and actively managed, but the vast majority of ETFs on the stock market are passive index tracking ETFs. Because of this, a lot of the time you'll hear the term ETFs and index funds used interchangeably, but they're not the same thing. If you wanted to invest in the S&P 500, you could go with an S&P 500 index fund, like the Vanguard one that I mentioned earlier, or you could go with Vanguard's ETF version of the same index fund. A cool thing about ETFs is that they will usually have much lower management fees than their corresponding index fund. With the Vanguard S&P 500 fund that we were using before, the index fund version, like I mentioned, has a fee of 0.04% per annum but the ETF version has an even lower fee of only 0.03% per annum. The downside of ETFs though, is that they are typically kind of come with any trading costs associated with the brokerage that you need to pay to buy and sell stocks. However, depending on which country you are in and which broker you're using, this can be quite low and you can minimize this or even potentially nothing, which would remove this potential downside. But, and this is something most other people have failed to mention when covering this topic, index funds also have costs associated with buying and selling, and these can often be comparable to brokerage you are paying. It's something called the buy and sell spread cost, and is usually around sort of 0.05%. So make sure you are aware of this when looking at index funds and you look this up before you decide which one to use. Now, as I mentioned earlier, ETFs trade just like stocks. And so you can buy one share of an ETF at whatever price it's trading at, whether it's $100 or whatever, and you are now invested in that fund. So unlike index funds, there is no minimum balance requirement with ETFs, as long as you have enough money to purchase one share. But if you don't have that, then you are kind of out of luck 
Whereas with an index fund, you can actually buy fractional shares without much hassle. Some brokerages actually allow you to buy fractional shares of an ETF, but others do not. So if you ever need to move your money to a different brokerage, how these fractional shares are treated can get actually really complicated. So always check with your brokerage to see what they will allow and be aware that things can get a little complex if you ever do need to move your money around. So this brings me to my next point on why ETFs are a bit more flexible than index funds. You can actually transfer your ETFs between different stock brokers if you want without actually triggering a capital gains event. However, with index funds, you are stuck with your money in that account and the only way to move it would be by selling units, which would trigger a possible capital gains event, which means you would need to pay tax at a potentially non-ideal time. Personally, I actually purchase all of my investments through ETFs now. When I first started investing, I actually started out with a Vanguard index fund, but these high fees really started adding up over time and the spread between them in Australia where I live is actually huge. The Vanguard Australia Shares Index Fund has management fees starting at 0.75% per annum when the equivalent ETF on the ASX VAS only has a fee of 0.1% per annum. That's seven times lower. Also, and I'm not sure if this has actually changed now, but when I wanted to withdraw my funds from the Vanguard Index Fund, the only way to do this was to fill out a paper form and mail it to their office, which took about two to three weeks to eventually get my money back into my account. Ultimately, the best one for you is gonna depend on what you're actually trying to achieve. If you're someone who tends to panic sell and worry a lot and you don't really need access to money quickly, then using an index fund instead of an ETF might be a lot better, even if the fees are slightly higher. However, if you want a small chance of actually beating the overall market with a guaranteed chance of paying higher fees, then you might actually wanna look at actively managed mutual funds. But in saying that, there have been dozens, if not hundreds of studies that have been done on this and that have proved time in the market beats timing the market in the majority of situations. And a study done by Charles Schwab in 2012 found that between 1926 and 2011, over any 20 year holding period across the broad market, index funds never produced a negative return. So nobody can predict what the market is gonna do in the short term. And if someone says they can, they're lying to you, so don't get scammed. So I say, why even bother trying? Instead, I just invest whenever I have the money with the expectation of holding it one to two decades and I'll eventually come out ahead. Now in terms of actually doing this, it is really just as simple as either opening a stock market brokerage account or an index fund account and just keep buying the same investments over and over again and expect to grow your wealth at the same rate as the entire stock market. And that's pretty much it. That's all you have to do. It's really basic, super simple and the strategy will be perfect for the majority of investors out there all for a super low cost. I mean, there really just isn't much to not like about this strategy. Any of these options are probably gonna be better than trying to pick individual stocks yourself. Just do your research and pick whichever one makes the most sense for you. Personally, for me, it's ETFs, but that might not be the same. Now, with that said, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate it. And if you guys made it to the very end and you haven't already subscribed, please make sure to hit that subscribe button down below. I post videos every week. So if you wanna stay tuned with that, make sure to hit that button. Now, let me know in the comments what you would like me to cover next and gently tap that like button down below to help share this video to others who might also find it useful as well. Thank you again for watching and until next time, bye.